we have about 30 slides to get through. I'll try to be very quick with some of them. So uh, starting with heritage itself, very quickly, <laughs> you know, the definitions that we go by. Um, there are uh, certain classical definitions, but they're always you know, revolving around how um, everything that human societies produce um, in terms of value systems and this, the culture um, of living, how it's passed on from the past to the future and the continuum in time um, is how heritage um, really positions itself, let's say. And um, the fact that uh, cultural heritage um, cannot really be thought and independently of natural heritage anymore and that buildings and physical objects and sites cannot be thought independently of the people or the practices, the soft tissue, the living tissue that is intangible heritage. You know, uh, these need to be thought of together. Um, so from the start, all these definitions need to come together. Um, we can say uh, then just looking at sustainability. Um, so where does uh, sustainability come from really? How did it become the big buzzword of our day? Uh, it does go back to many decades, mid 20th century, um, with the effects of uh, industrialization on um, territories and um, societies, uh, the environmental degradation that was observed. Um, Rachel Carson's Silent Spring is a seminal book that, that has really brought this uh, to the attention of the public. Then we have you know, other seminal uh, uh, documents come out, limits to growth, um, the development of ecology, environmental ethics, respect for all forms of human beings, not just uh, the anthropo, but the bio, you know, from moving from an anthropocentric to a biocentric worldview. Um, and this all brought us to the 1987 Brundtland Report, uh, where we have the official definition of sustainable development that we still often refer to, development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So not stealing from our grandchildren's ability to have clean air, water, culture, a good life, uh, be very basic. And uh, I always like to try to phrase these in very basic layman's words, if possible, uh, because our scientific jargon can be an obstacle, to be honest, in, especially with development uh, debates. Uh, development, what does that mean? Um, well, again, it's about the well-being of people, not only individually, but socially, our collective rights, uh, our right to um, improve our situation um, and uh, within the framework of, framework of economic, political, social systems on a long-term, on a sustainable basis. Uh, so development per se is not really a bad thing. Um, maybe um, unsustainable development versus sustainable development. Um, that is the really the crux of the matter uh, because development can be, you know, um, for us, especially heritage people, archeologists, architects, development is often uh, such um, a taboo or no, not, not a taboo, but such a negative connotation word, uh, but it's actually just in the way that uh, societies and policy policymakers, decision makers, perhaps conceive of development that um, has brought us to, um, to the problems we have today. So um, onwards, uh, how has uh, sustainability and sustainable development uh, become a global uh, topic of conversation? Uh, well, uh, you just saw in the previous slide uh, a reference to Rio uh, 21, the 1992 conference on the Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro, uh, where we started to really talk about the agenda um, for environmental sustainability so broadly. Um, and um, that has continued um, with, uh, and the UN system um, has periods, periodically, you know, updates um, of their agendas. And um, in 2004 to 15 years until 2015, uh, the UN adopted the previous uh, sustainable development agenda, the MDGs, Millennium Development Goals, eight uh, goals at that time, more geared toward the developing world, um, and more ba basic human needs. Uh, uh, but even then, the inequalities uh, within and among countries, the uh, exponential rise of population and emissions and um, the depletion of resources, these were still uh, the problems that were addressed at that time. Uh, in 2015, uh, we came to a turning point. We're talking about the post-2015 development agenda, transforming our world, and um, of course the SDGs, um, the um, very um, colorful and uh, very attractive graphically, let's say, um, and um, uh, very slogany, um, of course, um, um, icons uh, with 17 uh, big uh, thematic goal headings, uh, talking about all kinds of uh, human development uh, issues, poverty, 
hunger, education, um, energy consumption, uh, economic growth, of course, um, environmental protect protection, peace, justice, uh, everything under the sun, perhaps, uh, what has been attempted to be captured. And to be honest, maybe it's miraculous that all countries of the world have signed up to such an ambitious global plan, a plan of action. Perhaps not all stakeholders were aware what they were signing up to, because if they had, <laughs> um, maybe the challenges and uh, what it entails in terms of transforming our ways of living, working, uh, thinking, uh, you know, would have been too daunting. Um, but here we are. And uh, this is uh, what we are supposed to achieve by 2030. We only have now less than 10 years left, actually eight years. Oh my God, yes. <laughs> and we are off track, especially with the pandemic. Um, but uh, the aspiration is there and this has really caused a big mobilization around, you know, at all levels, uh, policy circles, um, I'm sure you are coming across um, the SDGs in your own work. Uh, there are thematic agendas that complement the, the uh, UN 2030 agenda. Of course, the climate agenda, COP26, we just had in the UK. Uh, the urban, the new urban agenda uh, that was uh, renewed. Um, the um, uh, Habitats agenda in 2016 in Quito, as well as uh, ones for finance and um, disaster reduction, um, etc. All these come together uh, with the five P's: um, people, planet, prosperity, peace, and partnerships. Um, our uh, slogans, in a way. Uh, also um, noteworthy are that we have three dimensions um, of sustainable development that are uh, widely um, adopted: the social, economic, environment, and part of the advocacy work that I'm been involved in is to actually get a fourth one adopted at the same level, that is the cultural dimension. Somehow the cultural dimension in development uh, policy is uh, neglected or missing, lagging behind. Um, and you know, this is um, a big a topic of debate, what the, the reasons behind this or the obstacles to improving the situation. It's, um, a, I think, a very exciting um, uh, place to work on. Uh, so all of this global policy agenda, um, it doesn't mean much if it does not uh, get implemented and localized on the ground. Um, these slogans of leave no one behind, tell everyone, it needs to get through to every single person really on the street. And um, we may question how mainstream it really is still. Uh, but uh, the, as more time passes, we see that more local governments and local actors are uh, embracing uh, the uh, UN agenda. It, um, it really is not meant to stay at a global level. It has to come down to all levels, uh, down all the way to subnational, national, regional, local, um, community, neighborhood, uh, family, and um, our own agency as individuals um, in the decade of action. Um, here you see the high level political forum um, image HLPF, the annual SDG summit in New York where, where progress is reviewed, uh, where um, ECOMOS, when I was uh, working as SDG's focal point, uh, we uh, were going uh, attending these forums and fora every year. Um, now it's all online, of course, but continuing, of course. Um, so the sustainability debate um, has um, inevitably uh, had ramifications on how we are talking about heritage uh, these days. Um, heritage as a concept is expanding, especially um, toward, uh, as I mentioned before, the connection with nature and the connection with people. Um, here uh, you see some various uh, current definitions of how heritage is just much, so much more than um, monuments. Um, it has so much um, to do with social well-being, uh, you know, identity, memory, sense of place, sustainable development, better urban development. Um, and our scope is widened, which means that we are um, breaking silos and we need to synergize with different sectors, uh, unconventional partners, new stakeholders to talk to. Also try to embrace concepts um, of risk management and resilience, of course, and how this um, implies um, dealing with change as a constant. And um, you, know, you know that as heritage people, sometimes we have to explain how we are not trying to freeze things in time. We do need to keep up with change. Change is part of culture, it is part of heritage, especially when we're talking about living, evolving heritage. And um, also how heritage can sometimes be an obstacle in front of progress. Um, I think women's rights, gender issues, for example, is a very good example uh, that we um, always refer to, um, how we need to um, perhaps shed some traditions, shed, shed some heritage, 
or uh, reinterpret or come to terms with difficult dark heritage. Um, I think Bathia is um, one of the experts in the world who really deals with those kinds of um, issues um, with heritage. Um, in COVID times, we saw especially how heritage, um, the cultural, natural, open spaces, historic places, art and culture as a, um, a source of comfort um, and, and mental health, you know, uh, was so important and undervalued really. So uh, trying to bring that to the front, especially now during recovery plans um, of uh, local national governments. Here you see target 11, uh, the urban goal on cities under which we have target 11.4 for protecting the world's cultural and natural heritage. And that has an indicator uh, to measure progress um, uh, to do with expenditure, uh, how much money is spent to protect heritage. Uh, this has been widely debated um, to be um, insufficient and new indicators have been um, developed, but this is the one that the UN has adopted for this uh, period in time. Um, so, uh, in trying to expand the concept of heritage uh, at ECOMOS, um, our uh, rights-based approaches group and sustainable development goals working group, uh, we collaborated with other uh, groups um, in ECOMOS to um, have this resolution on people-centered approaches adopted in 2020, uh, talking about the connection of people with heritage and places, intercultural dialogue, uh, resiliency and justice toward climate action, and uh, also um, synergizing with all kinds of uh, other uh, sectors, uh, the relevant sectors, you know, social uh, peace building, cultural and creative industries, nature conservation, tourism, urban planning, infrastructure, energy provision, etc. cetera, um, really everything. And um, in terms of international advocacy, you know, one way to frame this is um, the crises that we are um, uh, dealing with uh, today around the world, the climate crisis, the planetary crisis um, is not really so, um, it, it cannot be separated from the human crises, crises of misgovernance, inequality, mistrust, the poverty gap, um, now health crises, all of these are inter interconnected and the solution has to be interconnected as well. So culture and heritage actors need to be mainstreamed in the sustainability efforts. This is a two-way advocacy trying to um, raise the profile of culture and cultural heritage within non-culture um, uh, platforms, but also bring to fore sustainability uh, issues and ideas into our own heritage and cultural uh, work as well. You know, it has to be both ways. Um, UNESCO has been um, continuing efforts since the 1970s in this respect. Um, a lot of the declarations and resolutions reports have come out. We still see though that uh, we are underrepresented and are underestimated. Um, so estimated um, as an under measured um, uh, and the metrics is also the quantifiability of culture is, is one issue. Here you see the UNESCO thematic indicators for culture that just came out in 2019. Uh, that's um, a important um, step in this um, direction. Um, so back to the uh, advocacy that we do at ECOMOS, um, we have um, really adopted the idea that uh, this is a time for transformation, including cultural heritage protection. Uh, in 2021, uh, we managed to issue this new uh, flagship uh, document, the policy guidance for, for both heritage and development actors, addressing each of the 17 um, SDG headings. Uh, here you see an example of um, 16, peace, governance, and, uh, and justice, uh, talking about how we can integrate heritage as a positive contributor, how we need to protect heritage from harm on unsustainable harmful development processes and how we have to align and improve heritage practice uh, so that it is uh, better um, supporting um, sustainable development objectives. You can download this um, from the link you can see here. Um, I would um, hope that you have a chance to look at this. Um, we really had um, have had very high hopes that this will um, help a lot of uh, advocacy and lobbying and um, uh, mind, um, you know, like, let's say, also um, not only opening minds, but also providing um, some of the very largely untapped evidence base. You know, there is a lot of case studies, a lot of very valuable research that's done, but how is this actually um, brought together, consolidated and synthesized into the right language so that it reaches the ears of policymakers or people who you know, uh, budget for uh, things, budget for more protection, uh, budget for uh, more investment um, in heritage, for example. So a policy um, uh, 
um, instrument there. Uh, another very important uh, channel is the, of course, the nexus of cultural heritage and climate action. Uh, at ECOMOS, we have a strong climate change, change and heritage working group. Uh, the 2019 report, uh, the future of our pasts was issued uh, just uh, bringing together all of the uh, overlapping um, subjects. Um, it was a great overview of um, all the headings that uh, we need to um, take into account. Um, ECOMOS declared a climate emergency in, in 2020 and uh, the Climate Heritage Network, uh, where ECOMOS is right now uh, providing to the Secretariat services for, uh, is growing uh, for with about 280 members, uh, government institutions, cultural institutions, small businesses, universities. So if you have um, any um, um, possibility to join, uh, you are very welcome. Um, th these kinds of movements need to grow. Um, so that's the Climate Heritage Network for you. Uh, another important um, uh, network that e ECOMOS um, is part of uh, and many other important um, cultural um, networks around the world like uh, UCLG's culture committee, the local government's um, culture committees, International Council of Music, of libraries, uh, regional European re and African cultural institutions, one for uh, cultural diversity. Uh, we all came together in this campaign to hopefully this time in 2030, the, S the sustainable development agenda, whatever it may be called, whatever it may look like, will have a culture goal. <laughs> Um, cultural heritage is still in the one of the luckier aspects of culture. Uh, at least we have our own target. But uh, culture, uh, there have been in the document a few references to cultural diversity, a few references to cultural products, local products, but really, uh, and also a culture of peace under education. Uh, a lot of the uh, the connections between cultural ma matters and how heritage as a re repository of experience of embodied energy, how it can contribute to many other goals. These are not really acknowledged. So hopefully, perhaps in 2030, all of these campaigning uh, will um, help the UN to make um, a little bit more friendly um, policy decisions for, for our sector. Um, so the Culture 2030 Goal Campaign, uh, really um, the motor of it being UCLG, which has funded two reports um, over the last years, one for looking at the VNRs, the national reports for SDG review uh, to the UN, and the VLRs, the local reports. We have actually scanned all of them and looked for the presence of culture and heritage and um, uh, libraries, archives, um, traditional knowledge, indigenous uh, knowledge, um, how all of these figure in these reports by countries and cities. Um, the re results show that there is a lot of potential. It's um, largely untapped. Uh, cities are in much better shape than countries. The local government level is much more attuned to how culture is a catalyst and a mobilizer and an important policy topic, to be honest. That's what we have found. Uh, and many other um, goal headings, not just 11, the urban goal, but uh, uh, one for inequalities, justice, uh, for education, of course, for gender equality, also for decent work, um, creative industries, for peace building. These are strong um, uh, goals that uh, you can see more of culture top mention in. So um, the Culture 2030 Goal Campaign also uh, issued a statement on protecting and um, placing at the heart um, of recovery culture and during the pandemic. Uh, you can endorse this statement as well. Here's the link. Sorry, I'm doing a little bit of campaigning even as I speak to you. This has become my natural modus operandi, so <laughs> please excuse me. Um, but uh, it's part of information sharing um, and um, um, synthesizing our efforts, let's say. Um, here you can see some um, images uh, of the events we held to launch um, our reports and our uh, cultural COVID statement. Um, we had the endorsement of uh, um, the UN uh, president of the GA, uh, we had UNESCO's contribution, World, World Health Organization's contribution as well. Um, so <clears throat> this was a time when we realized that arts and health, um, there have been a new uh, report and some important research done, and it is now scientifically in our hands, the evidence of how arts can improve health. Um, so uh, the writers of that report were also part of our events. Um, very new, interesting new topics that we are discovering as heritage people um, doing all of this um, um, in intersectoral work. 
Um, so uh, I'd like to share some snippets of the um, VLR texts that uh, we came across. The uh, local governments are really on board with um, understanding how culture is important. You see here Espo from Finland talks about culture and heritage as a DNA of the city, talking about how reaching the youngest is important and the uh, world of culture and education, the value change we need, uh, how cultural diversity enables um, policies to get closer to people um, and how it actually makes societies more um, inventive and intelligent. Um, so many, many different ways um, that uh, local governments are recognizing um, the, the role of culture and heritage. Um, these are um, also some uh, snippets uh, of how um, I had the chance um, as a, the culture person now invited to some of these local government platforms, uh, the messages uh, one can give um, to mayors who have very little time to listen to you or um, you know, economists who are uh, browsing different sessions with different themes, uh, talking about how we are a valuable and vulnerable resource, how we connect people to their land, how we need to be harnessed fully, how we are part of transforming our value systems, and how leaders and policymakers at all levels can support and benefit from culture and heritage networks and expertise. We have expertise, we are here to serve. We just need to tap into our expertise and we need to make it available to them. Again, this policy science interface we're talking about. Um, now, in the remaining little part of my uh, time, um, I would like to switch from this global lens to the implementing um, the local on the ground um, part of uh, my work. Um, so um, as a bridge between how um, the global talk um, comes across is reflected in um, the local sites. Um, the world, UNESCO's World Heritage and Sustainable Development Policy um, has been an important um, milestone again uh, in, in guiding sites uh, managers, World Heritage site managers on um, how to deal with sustainability. Um, and we uh, need to do this localizing business in our World Heritage um, work as well, if you are involved in World Heritage sites. Um, here you see um, the distribution of the World Heritage sites on this map uh, with um, a lot of the red uh, dots you can see are concentrated in certain regions, the Arab states, Africa, the, and then a lot of in South Latin America, um, a lot of nature sites in Africa under threat of poaching, looting, um, very, very dangerous uh, uh, jobs sometimes to, to actually guard natural heritage, um, wars, conflict, um, and um, uh, how all of these, um, Every site has its own context and uh, it has to be understood within its own socioeconomic um, realities, really. Um, so uh, now I'm going to go through a few um, different uh, localities where I've worked um, going more or less chronologically. Um, this was uh, back in the early 2000s. Um, it was um, a project, EU project, uh, bringing together uh, Turkish and Greek um, uh, experts, um, our neighbors, um, who um, we share, with whom we share this uh, legacy of the humanitarian crisis of the population exchange of 1923. And there's a lot of Muslim heritage left in Greece and in the Balkans um, as well. A lot of Christian heritage, of course, in Anatolia, in Turkey. And uh, we were going back and um, back and forth with workshops and exhibitions and um, uh, revisiting uh, the situation and um, being able to open a space for dialogue to talk about the memories and um, the um, issues of actually uh, properly appropriating and uh, safeguarding these places. Uh, this won a Europa Nostra prize at that time, one of uh, a very good memory and very educational um, project. Um, then um, the times when I did my own PhD dissertation on urban conservation projects and governance, um, I was looking at three uh, focused case studies with um, about 40 less focused, more superficial case studies. Uh, the three were a large, a medium sized and a small town with large urban uh, development dynamics. One which was shrinking and expanding tourist uh, place, Kushadası, Gaziantep, Kushadası and Mudurno in Turkey. And the Mudurno's case study uh, really marked 
um, the past decade of my career, I, I uh, somehow um, developed these bonds with that uh, town where I thought I could really help as an expert, um, a small town, preserved town, a nice environment to work in, and they needed technical assistance. And how I suggested to do a postdoc research project, a site management plan, I became the site manager there, um, the plan author, um, then Certain things happened, a little bit of politics, let's say, um, a little bit of capacity issues, and we ran into some uh, problems, and um, now I'm not the site manager anymore, and our UNESCO World Heritage Site candidacy is stalled. It, it, we had an unsuccessful attempt, um, and um, uh, certain um, difficulties for uh, in our um, site management you know processes but i will come back to moderno later and um, that is a, a, still going on in in a different way uh, so the phd dissertation before going um, on to it it was interesting to look at different typologies and scales um, but all in all um, the hypothesis was that we need um, a combination of certain factors um, the financial, um, the public authority, the social component, civil society, the scientific component, and the component that brings all these together, good governance, a good visionary leadership with all kinds of urban projects. And this was more or less really uh, demonstrated in, in many places. And one interesting other takeaway was that mistakes made in the early stages were corrected over time. So you need to have a reiterative process with these things and capacity building. Um, so, uh, looking into Moderna a little bit more, a uh, small town, uh, economic de decline, uh, big poultry industry, lost mostly in the recession of 2001, reinventing itself as a cultural tourism destination, a Silk Road town, um, guild traditions are still alive because it has now fallen off the main track. It has been forgotten um, and preserved, but um, it cannot go on being neglected and forgotten forever because now it's going undergoing an erosion, um, social and physical. Um, so the site management was uh, a very um, participatory and exciting time, very good governors at that time who supported such a project. Uh, so uh, you can see here the um, table of actions under um, several um, target headings and uh, policy headings. Um, looking at management, organizing, documentation, research, improving the physical realm. So that's where all the conservation work uh, lies. Tourism and visitor management, education, capacity building, developing um, synergies with other economic sectors and risk management. Uh, so it was quite a comprehensive plan as uh, they need to be. Um, so the site management plan was adopted in 2014, but um, I continued to press the mayor and the local government to say let, we need to implement these and let's start some projects. So uh, what, some of our um, first projects included um, having a new city brand, a logo uh, with a national competition, um, a very um, prestigious photo exhibition and catalog for 1920s, 1930s photos taken of the town, um, UNESCO World Heritage Camp, the sea, um, Chita Slow, Slow City Network application that was successful, and I think it's very the slow city, Chita Slow um, uh, framework is uh, very appropriate for uh, rural um, and small town. Uh, settings especially uh, it does include um, heritage preservation but that but not only um, you know a, a good lifestyle preserving the environment and uh, energy efficiency um, very well-rounded concepts in in the Chita slow network uh, so as i was saying um uh, we had a nomination uh, process that lasted until 2019 when we got a rejection from ECOMOS, <laughs> my own ECOMOS. It was a very interesting year, um, double role. Um, uh, it had to be managed carefully uh, in terms of conflict of interests. Um, and uh, I think a lot of um, the, like, let's say, how to interpret this uh, seeming failure. I'm nowadays, I'm actually um, not, not, not so unhappy about our so-called failure, not to uh, go down the list, uh, it, it wasn't ready. And, uh, you know, it, it does bring in new stresses to a place. So um, we need, we just need a lot of more capacity, financial and institutional to do better physical conservation. And I don't think we had the research um, uh, time and budget to do a proper analysis of how the town's fabric was reflecting this uh, guild tradition, the Ahi, the very special Ahi tradition. Um, 
And I made a calculation of how much money we might need to actually be more ready, which was uh, 50 million lira at the time. <laughs> I'm sorry I'm talking money, but we need to talk. <laughs> um, it, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting topic uh, of how culture people deal with finance and economics. And I mean, I'm, I'm just uh, very, um, I feel very much at the beginning of that kind of education, but uh, uh, I like to just uh, tease uh, my colleagues wh whenever I can about how it's important. Anyway, let's, um, so I have been um, discontinued of my site manager, manager um, role um, effectively since 2020. Unfortunately, right now it's all in a hiatus. Um, in the meantime, I've been consulting with other sites uh, for site management plans or similar uh, heritage management projects. Well, this is in a um, district of Istanbul, Eyüp, um, uh, which is uh, just north of the historical peninsula. Uh, it was just north of the land walls of Theodosius um, and the first Muslim neighborhood that was set up after the conquest in 1453. Um, it, it is a major uh, Islamic pilgrimage site um, around the world. Um, and what we discovered that uh, there was such a multiplicity of layers there. Um, this, this was a university project for an academic management plan. Uh, very uh, different types of diverse values, but the place Ayyub was um, known almost solely for the um, the landscape, the view, the wonderful view of the Golden Horn and the Islamic pilgrimage, the Ayyub Sultan Mausoleum. Um, but actually uh, there was a lot of uh, interpretation that could be done and we were proposing these and also the waterfront relationship. A lot of transportation infrastructure was um, cutting off the fabric from the water. Um, and uh, this ran into uh, governance issues with Istanbul Metropolitan Site Management Directorate. They did not want a smaller directorate to be set up, um, a little bit of uh, metropolitan versus district, smaller municipality, you know, um, tug of war. Um, I'm maybe I will be quoted somewhere, this is recorded. Um, this is my interpretation, you know, um, so uh, it, does, it may not sound very sci scientific to you today, but um, uh, so I need to make that disclaimer, uh, but I was in the meetings um, where um, the Istanbul site management um, advised against it due, due to governance reasons, but still it was a very good exercise in terms of getting uh, different uh, parties to talk to each other. Um, uh, now jumping to another part of Turkey, uh, Konya, uh, the small um, vicinity of Ivriz, where we have an amazing Hittite um, rock um, monument, uh, which is also uh, surrounded by a water landscape, sacred water landscape since the Byzantine and um, even earlier times. Um, a professor um, at Koç University was the um, head of this survey project. Um, and here, the interesting thing was that um, we were stuck between jurisdictions of natural and cultural heritage uh, because they have unfortunately been separated in Turkey since 2011. Before 2011, we had cultural and natural um, protection sites looked after by the same ministry and the same commissions. Now the natural sites have been handed over to the Ministry of Environment and Urbanization. What an interesting name, don't you think? <laughs> you might think that's an oxymoron, environment and urbanization. And um, those uh, legal changes have had interesting ramifications in terms of um, you know, extraction and natural site uh, statuses. Um, I mean, Turkey is undergoing um, quite a difficult period of really um, uh, nature protection, let's say. Um, and, we could also say um, urban renewal, um, a much more aggressive capitalist um, uh, um, project um, attitudes and um, the capital that comes into these places, uh, which are very much supported by the government. Um, the Turkish civil society, it is still, um, uh, it still fights and um, there are interesting battles won. Um, and one thing that I can tell you um, as a person witnessing all of these, um, the, the most valuable part perhaps is not when we are fighting, but when we actually sit down in dialogue. And it's so rare 
Um, and when it happens, I just try to jump at the chance. It's very difficult to sit down at the, uh, you know, on a, a table. And it's easier to um, witness this at a local level. I think people have more shared uh, problems um, at a local level, is, is, is my experience. Uh, well, Chidam, uh, the professor on, on, in charge of this, is a go-getter. So she finally managed to um, persuade the ministries. And this site is also on the UNESCO tentative list. Um, Back to Istanbul, this is something that I've been involved in since last year. Um, the Istanbul Citizens Assembly um, has been um, set up for the first time in Istanbul um, uh, two terms ago. Um, so that's about four years ago. Uh, sorry, less actually, two, two and a half years ago. Um, and they have various working groups. Um, and I was a part of a group who set up the uh, Urban Culture and Cultural Heritage Working Group. Now we are um, uh, regularly meeting and um, uh, um, holding some um, webinars or panels or um, issuing statements um, and asking actually different um, government bodies for information on what's going on. There are, like Istanbul is, you know, one of the most complex urban places in the world, you could say. And um, so many different development projects are going on and some of them are in the World Heritage Site and just trying to be a watchdog, you know, in, in, it, it, we are um, only really tapping into the potential of how a watchdog function can, can really benefit the site management. Um, the, so the Metropolitan Municipality um, is very um, social democrat minded and really supports these and some of the district municipalities um, are uh, more friendly to these kinds of particip participatory mechanisms, but not all. Uh, so it's really a checkered landscape, um, but uh, it's very exciting that the municipality Metropolitan Municipality has actually given us uh, an opportunity to um, upsource or crowdsource you know civil civilian voices and i um, and um uh, ideas and and activities into the actual urban management um uh, sphere uh, and uh, it's very also interesting to go to meetings of the other working group moderators um, and uh, one topic of conversation in these meetings is that Istanbul should also have a VLR. It does not have a VLR yet. Last year, one district municipality made um, wrote a VLR and I know this year Fatih, the, where the World Heritage Site is located, uh, Fatih municipality is doing a VLR and hopefully Izmir, um, Istanbul Metro will do one as well um, in the near future. In Turkey, also Izmir, a municipality and um, the third largest city on the west coast they have done a vlr and actually they commissioned me to write their culture section they had a whole culture section <laughs> so i'm, I'm uh, extending our thanks and congratulations to um one of our metro municipalities in turkey for embracing culture like that so coming back to moderna in my last uh, three minutes or so um if you google moderna today what you encounter is not really what um, all of these heritage management efforts projects that I've been talking to you about. It is um, a very interesting real estate development called Burj El Babas, the name um, referring to Burj El Arab in Dubai, maybe you know about it. Uh, it is catering to Gulf tourists or people who want to buy um, a villa uh, in this Black Sea lush green part of Turkey, which they like to do. Um, and it's a completely kitsch and um, historicist and fantasy kind of a very dense um, urban development, which has gone bankrupt. So we have hundreds of chateaus that have nothing to do with Moderno's uh, local uh, texture uh, that um, the um, investors are, um, have declared bankruptcy and they keep getting bailed out for some reason. If they gave me the money, <laughs> Or people like us, you know, heritage site managers, imagine what we could do with that. <laughs> uh, this is thankfully just outside Moderno. It's not visible from the city center that you see in the photo above. So um, I've written a recent article uh, for Ecomo Serbia um, comparing um, the resort Moderno of Burjia Babas with the heritage Moderno UNESCO candidate Anchitoslo Moderno and how in terms of the SDGs and sustainability they have very different approaches. Um, 
So um, even though uh, this um, abandoned project, you know, it's still trying to be revived um, and uh, home to uh, dystopic vi like music videos, you know, you can find them online actually now. Very interesting dark tourism destination, you could say. While that is sitting there, I have continued my efforts in Modernu by uh, buying a share in a historic building myself and becoming um, kind of a local stakeholder now. Uh, we are restoring this house and we would like to convert it into a multi-use, uh, not only private residence, but a BNB and a cultural um, activity center. I have also set up a new company called Terra Modurno. Uh, this is an incorporated um, company with shareholders and I am raising uh, money since last July. I think I raised about um, 140,000 lira so far uh, to actually try to either buy or um, rent or um, and basically repair and operate certain flagship uh, buildings in Moderna that really direly need saving. So grand ambitions, but so, so far um, our um, company has about 18 shareholders and um, it's already in um, uh, communication with uh, my partners in the building owners to actually have um, the space run by this new company. So, you know, I'm trying to learn how to be a cultural entrepreneur in Moderno. Um, we'll see how that goes. Um, if this doesn't work out, then I will not die, you know, unhappy about Moderno. I've done everything I can. You know? um, this really galvanizes me um, as a kind of an activist, let's say. Uh, so coming to the conclusions, I'm a bit late, apologies. Well, let's see. Um, it's really about local engagement, capacity building, investment, uh, new heritage approaches, new models, uh, using digital technologies as well, um, not getting stuck on UNESCO World Heritage. There are other models and networks out there. Uh, resilience, flexibility, and long-term vision, um, and how we can harness heritage to address global challenges, how we can make our um, work more meaningful in terms of real change. Um, how can we converge fragmented pieces of knowledge? Um, how can we partner with other um, actors? Um, and how we, as researchers, um, how we can have a more interactive relationship with the 17 global goals, how we can communicate our ideas more effectively, um, interdisciplinary, um, how to use existing tools more effectively uh, for any advocacy, uh, create an active community of practice. And these kinds of platforms, um, like today, these are very valuable in terms of networking and um, connecting one new idea to something else that we're doing, connecting dots. So thank you very much for listening to me. And um, after this bombardment of information, if you have any questions for today or later, you are welcome to. Um, I will stop sharing if everybody's looked at the contact, de contact details. Uh, there you go. Thank you so much, Lydia. Thank you.